All right, good afternoon. Okay. There we go. All right, good afternoon, or evening, or whatever the hell this is. Um, welcome to week three-ish. Um, we're going to cover a topic called normalization today. And depending on how long this takes, I might start into next week's lecture so we can have a short lecture next week if this goes well. Normalization either goes really well or it goes horribly wrong. So there really isn't uh, a somewhere in between moment. Uh, so I'm hoping it's going to go well. And my keyboard's ignoring me. Well, that's never a good sign. It's a little swirly thing. All right, data normalization is a tool, not a tool as in an actual tool that you know, a program you double click on and magic happens. And it's not a tool like a screwdriver. It's a process. But as some people know, sometimes a process is also known as a tool. And the point of normalization is to validate and improve the logical design of a database so that it follows certain rules and it avoids duplicate. It avoids bad structures. And basically put, the summary of it is, no data normalization is the process of decomposing relations. In complex chunks of data and you're breaking the smallest components. Why do you want to break it down to its smallest pieces? Is so that you have to play with data in very controlled small pieces. It's better to work with small chunks of information at once than to work with big piles of information. Um, for example, how many of you can do a grocery list and memorize it? No, because your brain can't cope with full, full on chunks of information. Database servers handle that a lot better but by the same token, you make the developers work harder if you have to deal with bigger chunks of information. You also may allow damage to happen to your data. And well, I'm going to go through the three basic steps of realization. There's three forms. There's forms past that, but we're just going to talk about those in a cursory kind of manner. Um, so the, the end goals of normalization is as follows. You want a relation, also known as a table, that contains minimal data redundancy. So you don't want data to be repeated in a side of a table, unless you absolutely have to. And you can add, remove, and update information in such a way that you're not going to cause inconsistencies. And some of this has to do with how computers used to be years ago. Some of it so much. It really means when you have to add a new piece of information to the database and you end up having to create duplicate data. And actually, there's, I have examples coming through this of uh, each of these things later. Uh, deletion means if you delete information, you're losing unrelated information elsewhere. So it's as if I kick, you know, class and for some reason someone over there disappears too. Why? We don't know. Because you're related in such a weird way that both of you are gone. You don't want to do that because you don't want to delete unrelated information. Or even better, I remove you from the class and the whole class disappears. That's a deletion anomaly and it's bad. A modification anomaly is you're changing data in one place and you end up having to change it in many places. And in a bit I explain some of the, these kinds of anomalies and they get pretty nasty. So, on the screen I've got a grid, and it's probably, if you download the presentation from Blackboard, I'll have it on the screen so it's a little more readable for you. Um, but essentially, I've got a set of information in here, and these have certain kinds of anomalies. For example, the way this is set up is you cannot add an a new employee without having them take a class, or at least have a empty field of class, but the problem is that we've already got one person that has no class. That means we can't add another one like that. Deletion. If you look at employee number 140, this one right here, this Alan Beaton guy, if we delete him, 
we lose the fact that the tax accounting course is gone, no longer available because it no longer exists. That's called the deletion anomaly, where we delete an employee, and at the same time, we end up losing another piece of information, totally sort of related to him, but unrelated to him, and it still disappears. Yes? Yeah, because if right now, if you were to take this table as is, and you get, get rid of employee number 140, you see how it has tax accounting and tax ACC? Do you see it repeated anywhere else in the courses list? So what happens if you delete that row? The fact that tax ACC never existed is gone. That's called a deletion anomaly. That means you're deleting data that shouldn't be deleted because now you're losing fidelity. It's a bit like how you keep, you know, if you keep re-encoding a JPEG, eventually, you know, it gets really JPEG-y. It's all blurry because you're losing fidelity every time you make a change. It's actually deleting pieces of itself. In this case, doing something like that. Yes. So next week we hire Jill, and she's going to have to take the tax, tax accounting course. Now we don't know that there was one or not. Really, th th this is a simplified example where normally they would not be like this. Actually, you don't want to be like this at all. <coughs> but there once was a time where systems looked like this. And when you went to delete this guy, you'd actually have to create another table and just copy the ones that have been deleted temporarily so they could still look them up. Or they'd actually have a book with each of the codes in them. So you'd actually have to look up. They're using a computer, but they'd have to look up in a book what the codes are. You know when they're like, you go to the grocery store and they spin the wheel trying to figure out what the heck's... Bulk barn, 100% vegan granola. <laughs> Find the code, right? That used to be like, and the, the database itself will lose track if the tax course exists. B, it's still in a book somewhere. But, you know, maybe in three years from now, they forget what book it was in. Yes? That's, that's a... Anomaly in a flat structure, yes. We don't want to do flat. Later on, we're going to break down a different example, but I'll show you guys how it gets broken down so you don't lose stuff. And then, modification anomaly. If we give employee 100 a raise, we have to update two different rows. Right? Because you can see, Margaret Simpson's taken two different courses, but we have her salary repeated twice. That means we need to update her salary twice. Now, now today's computers are fast enough that odds are nothing would go wrong. Update where this set to that. But there once was a time where it was the old tape drives. The real thrill map. Some people must have seen a movie he's in it. They know the wheels turn, they go back and forth, and it's doing stuff. And then the tape He's laughing. It happened. And there was usually a lot of screaming when it happened. And that's one of the things that would be terrible with this old system is it would update the record here, then we'd have to scroll through the tape to go update the record. Tape breaks. The software goes, oh, no. And then suddenly you have inconsistency in your database where Margaret Simpson has two different salaries. Which one's the right one? Well, <laughs> maybe she just got a demotion. Right? But you're you're assuming, right? Therefore you you assume, therefore that's it. You never assume, especially when it comes to data. So the steps in normalization are as follows. And like I said, if you had the thing downloaded, it'd be a lot easier to read. So there is at the beginning you've got a table that's a mess, multi-valued attributes. You remove those, it becomes first normal form. Then we remove something called partial dependencies. It becomes second normal form. Get rid of something called transitive. And I'm going to explain which E these are in a minute. It becomes third normal form. And then there's other stuff. Did you notice it's on the next pane? These are what they call the higher forms. In most database system, third normal form is what we aim for at a minimum. So if your database is third normal form, it's probably pretty safe. So that's what we're going to aim for. Voice COD covers edge cases, fourth normal form 
covers a different kind of edge case. Fifth normal form covers edge cases that fourth normal form doesn't cover. You can see how this builds up, right, where each one builds on the previous version or uh, the previous form. And the magic trick is, is for 95% of the database tables out there, if you're in third normal form, you're probably in fifth. Basically, the differences between Boyce, fourth, and fifth, very small. It's just specific case cases. Okay. As always, we have some terminology. First one is functional dependency. That is when the value of one attribute determines the value of an other attribute. Now, that's usually a painful one to explain at first. Um, but, for example, if we're going to use a person's date of birth and their age, all the ones that attribute, we'll use that as our example. A person's date of birth det determines their age, right? Basically, that's the dependency. Now, when you talk about data, on the other hand, what do you mean by that is my, your value of database prof depends on the fact that I exist. So the functional dependency is you are my students. So you are functionally dependent on me to be able to exist in a database, in this database course. That's a functional dependency where the value of, you know, for you, database prof, its value is set by me, which is, you know, my personal value. That's functional dependency. It'll make more sense in a minute once you actually see real data and how it's broken down. Then there's the candidate key. Now, we already covered that last week. So basically put, it's a key that can be used to uniquely identify data. And, you know, credit card number, sys, social security number, SIN numbers, they could be candidate keys. And when you're doing normalization, that's good enough. You don't get keys at this level. You're just worrying about breaking down the data into chunks that make sense. And when you have a candidate key, each non-key field is function dependent on the candidate key. How did, what does that mean? For example, in Canada, when you do a tax return, you file your tax return and your SIN number is attached to it. The records for your tax return are functionally dependent on your SIN number. So when they look at the record in the database where, you know, line 122, line 140, line 156, for each year, those are going to be basically columns because I've seen the, some of the structure of the tax return system. It's a mess. But essentially, you've got your SIN number is your candidate key, and each of the columns next to it are functionally dependent on that, as in each of the on that one are totally dependent on your SIN number. Each version of your tax return depends on that. So I'm going to start with an invoice. You guys know what an invoice is? Yes, you have a question. Yes. I was just using it as an example for a real world example of when things are related to each other. In a second, on the next slide, I'm actually functional dependencies. So I've actually got an example. It'll make more sense. I had to get the, some of the terminology out there, so then when I apply it, it'll make more sense. Now, when you look at this, this is an invoice, and it's a terrible invoice, and it's not a valid relation by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, I'm assuming everybody in here knows what an invoice is, more or less, right? The piece of paper that says you owe this much money, and if you're lucky, the word paid is on it. Otherwise, you still owe that much money. Well, this one here is a very simple invoice for a manufacturing company where they, s they make furniture. And they sell furniture to their customers. And this is an example of a report of various invoices. And the reason why it's not a valid relation is there isn't a full set of information for each row. As you can see, invoice 1006 has a date, customer ID 2, value furniture, Plano, Texas, there's three items in it, but not all the information is included. That's why it's not considered a valid relation. This is known as a report. 
This is just output. Because at this point, it's easier for you to read because of the way it's broken down. But the database looks at this and goes, ha, 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 no. Totally unusable. And when it's in first normal form, right? So first normal form, there is no multi-valued attributes. By multi-valued attributes, this. At this point, they're multi-valued. Why? Because there's one row of this, three of these. So this is multi-valued. There's multiple values here for each one of those. There's multiple values here for each one of these. That's what that multi-valued means. So when we look at it this way, this is technically in first normal form. There's no multi-valued attributes anymore because every single row has a complete description, a complete set of information. There is no single piece in here that depends on another piece elsewhere. So this is no longer just dependent on this row because they have a full snapshot of themselves. So this is in first normal form. Literally, that is what first normal form means, is you've got a complete table where you can identify every, but you need every column to achieve it. Now, we've also established some candidate keys in this first step. And what are they? We've got the order ID and the product ID. Based on the combination of the product ID plus the order ID, we can find any row in here. So in order 1006, item number 4, we can find this. Order 1007, item number 4, we can find this. If we tell it, just give me item number 4, you'll end up with pieces of one order and pieces of another order. If you give it order 1006, you'll get three pieces back because you didn't identify which product ID it is. So at this time, the candidate key is a compound key. It's a combination of the order ID and the product ID. So I'll come over here and point at these fields for the guys on this side of the room. <laughs> so fully contained. Each row can identify itself. The problem is that if you only go with the order ID, if you grab 1006, it'll give you three rows back. You can't ident uniquely identify. Same thing, if you have just the product ID, if I say give me product number four, it'll give you two rows back, but you won't know. You just need to update the quantity ordered. Well, you won't know because, on the other hand, the way this one's set up is if you grab the order ID and the product ID together, combined, so 1007 product four, you can update its quantity because you can identify that whole row on its own. So the rule is in first normal form is there are no, no multi-valued attributes and you have candidate keys defined. That means you can pull back one row uniquely. That's the goal. It's totally terrible still. But at least at this point, you're able to look at the data. So it's a where basically the entirety is there, but it, you'd have to touch all kinds of places to actually get it to work. So. There's a few issues with the first normal form example that we had. One is, if a new product is ordered for order 1007 of an existing customer, customer data must be re-entered. For example, there's my mouse. I wish I could make my cursor bigger. See right here, 1007, product number seven to it. To be able to add product number seven, I have to re-enter the order date, the customer ID, the customer name, the address. So I have to add all this information all over again for every order. That's an insertion anomaly because you have to keep adding duplicate data just to be able to create a new order line. Deletion anomaly. If we look at order 1006 and get rid of the dining room table, 1006, here's our dining room table. If we delete this row, we lose the fact that we ever sold the dining room table. Gone. Data gone. And same thing. Updating. Changing the products of the price of product four. Here's product four here. Here's product four here. It's suddenly five, 625, not 650. What do we have to do to change the price? We have to go through row by row and go, oh, 
where it's order number 106, product number 4, 625. Go find the next product for, oh, it's in order 1007. Change to 625. Tape just broke. Data lost. Or suddenly you have different places, two different prices. Data inconsistency, it's a bad thing. So why does this exist? That's because there's multiple entity types. Do you remember last week when I talked about entity types, which is basically another word for just entity? It means that there's multiple versions of this, there's multiple kinds of data in the same structure. If I go back here and show you guys really quick, and I guess I'll do it with the mouse. We have products as an entity type. We have orders as an entity type. So these are two different things semant semantically where you have the order and then you got the stuff that people buy. The problem that we have is because we have the orders that people are placing and the stuff that they bought can buy as a separate item and we're basically putting it all in a big pot together, we end up having a mixed mash of data where it becomes very difficult to maintain. So you end up with anomalies. It's as if I, I said, okay, you have a pet dog, but you and the dog are the same thing. You can take the dog up for a walk. Or the dog is you. You're the dog. The dog walks you and you walk the dog. Right? It's a mess. It's, you know, a really stupid example, but it brings the point home where because you have the types of things, you end up with just your one thing just this one thing is a mess because you don't know where the tail starts and the, the fingers begin. Which brings us to, to be able to fix these issues, we have to go to the second normal form. So rule number one of second normal form, this one's the most obvious. You cannot be in second normal form unless you're in first normal form. It's impossible. Every non-key attribute is fully dependent on the entire primary key. The next slide actually breaks it down, so you see how the table breaks down. Every non-key attribute must be defined by the entire key and not of the key. That means, imagine, okay, those of us that have kids, and actually we blame each other for this all the time. You know, there's two of you that made, but let's just say that the entire existence of the kid only ex behaves on one half of the DNA in their body. For some unknown reason, you know, the other half doesn't even count. That means that because of this mess, you know, the other half of the DNA doesn't work. However, each attribute must be defined by the entire key, which then means the entire key has to find every single piece of the information in the database, in that table. Every single piece of data in that row must be defined by the entire uh, candidate key. If it's only defined part of it, that's a problem. And there can be no partial functional dependencies, which is basically a repeat of what I just said. So here's our, our wonderful graph. So earlier, you cut across the top, you had all the data going in this way. If you just look at the values going across the top, we have a bunch of pieces. What we want to do is we want to achieve the smallest combination of tables that are fully dependent on themselves. And currently, if we were to break that down, we'd have four different pieces. And out of the four pieces, one is called the transitive. That's However, we want to get rid of the full dependencies. So in other words, if there's full dependencies, we want to break those down to separate entities. So. When we look at this, this whole row, we have partials and fulls. And what we want is we want to have entities that are fully dependent on themselves. So there's no partials anywhere. So when we look at the order, right now the partial dependency of the order is this. The order date, the customer ID, the customer name, and the customer address is partially dependent because it's they've currently defined in it onto itself by the order ID. The product ID has nothing to do with the customer information. None at all. The 
the product ID identifies a table. Currently in its current state, I'm not saying we're done yet, the, in the current state, the order identifies the customer and where the order is going to, which has nothing to do with the table. The table is a table. The customer is a customer. They're two different entity types. The order is also not the table, when you think about it, because you have a warehouse full of tables that haven't been ordered yet. The tables, the piece, piece of information exists onto itself. That chair is a chair. It becomes more than a chair when it gets added to an order. But until it gets ordered, it's only a chair. So the order is broken down with the partial dependencies of the order ID identifies the date, the customer, and the address. The product ID identifies the description of the product, the finish of the product, and the standard price, also known as the you know, suggested retail price. That identifies a product, which leaves us with that poor one at the end, the quantity. The quantity, uh, it's got to go this way here. You guys can zing it down that way. <laughs> it's going to make him get up. So the quantity is fully dependent on an order ID and a product. So in order 1007, I ordered four tables. Therefore, the quantity is fully dependent on just the primary keys, right? In order 1007, I ordered four tables. Therefore, that quantity has nothing to do with the price, has nothing to do with the description of the product, has nothing to do with the finish of the product. But it does depend on a product, just not the independent pieces of it. So when we talk about the different entity types in this, there are three entity types plus what they call a transitive. The entity types are orders, products, and then the product orders. Now for those of you that were doing lab three, you've experienced this already a little bit. So we end up with tables that look like this. So we had that big long table, we end up with this structure after you've broken it down. You have the order ID, the product ID, and the quantity, also known as an order line. You have the product ID, the description, the finish, and the standard price, that's the product. And if you look at it, the order line is in third normal form. I'll point on this side for you guys. The third, the order line is in the third normal form already because there's nothing else you can do with it. It's broken down to the smallest piece. The product is also in third normal form because it's, it's also down to its smallest piece. Sometimes when you go to the second normal form, some of your entities just get promoted to third normal form automatically because they can't be broken down anymore. If it can't be broken down, it's already in third normal form. You end up with the last one, which is the order information, customer order. This one has something a little different in it. It's what has what's called a transitive dependency, which is why it's still in second normal form. What we have is an order has a date and a customer ID. The name and the address depend on the customer ID, but not on the order. But because the customer ID was not a candidate key, because you didn't need to know the customer ID to update the quantity that was ordered. If you don't need the customer ID to identify, to change how much was ordered, who cares at that point? Therefore, it was not part of the candidate key, but now what's happening is now that it's been broken down this far, we discover that the address and the name of the customer depends on the ID of the customer. Each order has a customer, but currently it's still in second normal form that if we update a customer's address, we have to update every line of that order because it's still going to be repeated multiple times. Yes? Yeah, the order ID is a primary key. And the problem is that parts of the data depend on only part of it. So what's happening is we have transitive dependencies. What a transitive dependency is, is it's a 
for attributes who a value off of a field who's find off another so it's a child of a child you don't want child of a child in the same table so you want to break it down further which is brings us to third normal form we're, we're not done yet all right third normal form what's rule number one of being in third normal form you must be in second normal form there you go believe it or not that might actually show up on a test somewhere along the way that particular question it must have no transitive dependencies. Remember what I was just talking about a second ago, where the yeah, customer's address is dependent on the customer ID, but the customer ID depends on the order ID? We need to stop doing that. You can't have a value that depends on a partial key that depends on another key. You can't have a key depend on a key. No trans transitive dependencies. It's called transitive because the primary key is a determinant for another attribute which in turn is a determinant for another attribute. Like I just said, a, f a field gets its value from, is, def is defined by a key, and that key's value is defined by another key. You can't have a key depend on a key. Imagine if you went to open your door at your house. Here you go, here's, here's the physical example. And you put the key in, but then to actually unlock the door, you gotta put another key in. So the first key's ability to unlock the door depends on the other key, the second key you put in. It's a weird setup, but that's essentially it. You have a key that depends on another key to be able to be defined. You don't want to do that. Yeah. Well, two keys, separate keys. Not a key inside a key, but you could do the same idea. So what's the solution for a third normal form? Is anything that is a non-key determinant, in other words, Anything where that determines the value of another column but is not part of the identif the candidate key for that particular row gets kicked out to its own table. And it breaks down like this. So the order customer orders table becomes as follows. The order has the order ID, the date, and a customer ID. We also have a customer table or customers, depending on what naming convention you want to use. What does this have? It has the ID, the name, and their address. So this allows us to change the address of a customer without ever having to touch an order. So you can change their address because you realize they have the wrong postal code. Or you know, you pulled a, an American thing where your postal codes now needed to be made more of them because they had to make more postal codes because they ran out of postal codes. Suddenly, instead of 90210, you have 90210-4567. And you need to update their record. So instead of updating 25 orders, you can just update the customer, the one customer record, and it just gets reflected automatically because it's in only one place. There is no longer any uh, repeated data. It's been broken down to its smallest component pieces. Yeah, you break the complex data into small chunks, and each small chunk is self-contained on itself, and you avoid repeating values. So if you look at a table and you see repeating values in it, you want to not do that. There are times where you don't want to go too far. Uh, you actually cause more dependencies, but each dependency is now controlled. Whereas before, if you nuked one piece, you'd lose something else. Now, if you just delete one customer, you don't lose the fact that the products existed. Which leads us to a diagram that looks like this. Now, this is going to look somewhat similar to what you've been doing in PG Modeler. Speci so now you guys are going, OK, this is a little more familiar. This is a really old notation style, because this came out of a really old textbook. But if you look at it, the I mean, because I wish I could make my mouse bigger. The customer, right here, around, can have many orders. The customer can place many orders. The customer, if we look at this notation here, the customer is required, but the customer may not have any orders. You could put a customer in, but they haven't placed an order yet. New customer. <coughs> put them into the system, save, because we're waiting to place an order. The order has many order lines. And this one's always a bit of a contentious moment, this particular rule here, which says each order must have an order line. Depending on how your system works, you may not have order lines right away. It's called an open order. 
but that's just x. So it's saying that each order can have multiple order lines, and each product can be ordered many times, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in every order. Now, thank you. Everybody signed? Now, this setup allows me to, let's say I want to change the price of a table and drop the price by 25 bucks. I don't need to change every order line because I can just change the standard price. Boom, done. Problem fixed. I can change the description or the finish. Let's say the fact that I called the cherry wasn't obvious enough and I had to change it to cherry red because apparently some people think cherries aren't red. Or instead of just being oak, I had to change it to golden oak because people don't know that oak is kind of yellowy colored. Just saying, you know, there's different finishes. Or you could put property of this table has four legs as opposed to table. Some people might not want a table that only has three legs. So those are descriptions you could change, but you could change all these pieces on the product without ever affecting the customer's information, when was the order placed, or even the quantity that was ordered. You could just update the information, just cascades automatically because you're changing the descriptions, not the identifiers. So for example, in Canada, if you change your name, so you go and you spend the whatever it is now, $200, and you get your name changed legally, your SIN number does not change. So your unique identifier does not change, but your description can change. Same deal. In this case, the description of the products can change without affecting anything else. This is the goal of proper normalization. When you're going through the steps of normalization, you want to try to break it down as much as you can so that nothing gets repeated. And if you need to, so the question is, did I succeed in doing this properly, yes or no, is when you look at the data and you say, if I change this person's email address, am I going to affect any other records? If the answer is no, you're good. If the answer is yes, your database is badly designed. It's just the way it is. Okay, now, past full form, which is, by the way, is the goal. When you design a database, it is considered to be properly normalized if you're in third normal form. If you achieve third normal form, it's considered properly normalized. Congratulations. You can go have a beer or whatever applies. A cup of tea, whatever. However, there are some higher normal forms. Voice cod normal form. If a relation has more than one candidate key, there could still be issues. It is possible that it be in third normal form and your entity has still some anomalies. That means that if every determinant, determinant in a relation is part of the candidate key, then it's voice cod. As I said earlier, it's basically the same thing as third normal form, except the odd edge case. The edge. Um, there's an English version of what I just said, which is a relation is in voice cod when every attribute or field depends on the key and nothing but the key. So if we look back at this, and you look at any of the columns that aren't part of the primary key, each of those are dependent completely on the key and nothing but the key. There might be the odd case where you have you know, one piece of information that doesn't depend on just the key. And maybe that should be pulled out to its own place. There are times where people abuse it, but that's what it is. Now, the other thing about Boyce Cod, it's also, it has a tree. It's known as normal form three and a half. Because it's somewhere between third normal form and fourth normal form. And it's only designed handle what they call an edge case. An edge case is when there's an exception to the rule, where 95%, 98% of the time, the rules work, and then you get those that one 
You know, we all have that friend, right, that doesn't cooperate. And you wish you could fix them. Well, you can in databases. It's called voice COD. Um, in the booklet, that Database Essentials booklet, I actually cover voice COD in a little more detail. Essentially, I just need to explain to you guys what voice COD means. That's what I'm I just did. That's what it means. Where every attribute or field depends on the key and nothing but the key. That means that when you look at an entire, uh, an entire entity, every single attribute or field on it depends on the key. Usually the fast way of fixing this is putting in a surrogate key. Put in a surrogate key, bang, voice COD. You're going, I don't know if this is good or not. Surrogate key, voice COD. It's the quick fix. Now, there's a few things I, I'd say. I'll leave it on the black screen. There's a few things I say about normalization. And I'm going to do a quick example on the board, I think. Oh, yeah. I had to check my time. Um, I lost my train of thought when I checked the time. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what I was going to say. And I lost it. It'll come back to me. Um, but I'm going to do an example on the board real quick that is not uh, what was on the screen. I just got to grab my markers. I got lots of markers. Okay. Man, I wish I could remember what the heck I was going to say. It wasn't that important because I didn't have it on a slide. But it was kind of a good to know on the slide. Okay, um, I guess the switch. Okay, I've got some data that's arranged like this, and I'm going to show you guys two different notations that that happen. My vets have really original names. Marker doesn't work. So I've, I'm color coding, and I'm sorry this is really hard to read, but okay. So here's my information, my basic structure, and. Currently, this table's in first normal. It's not quite in first normal formula because we haven't identified the candidate keys. So, looking at this, what would be the candidate keys? Okay, I've got a bunch of names out. Okay, 
vet and the pet and the IDs in this case. They end up being a three, technically, yes, because you, you can't change one without the other. And so you have a three-way candidate key in this one, which is really gross. But as it is, we have, um, we do have some repeating. We have, you know, the vets are repeating, right? The pets are repeated in random places. The procedures are repeated in random places. So what we want to do is we want to break it down to its smallest component pieces. And this one actually goes literally from first normal to third normal form with no in-betweens. So once you break it down, it ends up being self-contained. Because if I look at, it's going to be a different shade of blue. No, it doesn't work. All right. Right, so the pet name is dependent on the pet ID. The vet name is dependent on the vet ID. Okay? Now, the date of the procedure and the procedure is actually dependent on these guys. So these are actually technically a transitive. So if we technically we shouldn't have included this as a like this. So now it's you got the three pieces happening. I'm just going to erase some of my data so we I have room on the board to write. But if we before we start, before I go any further, I just want to point out the anomalies. What happens if we delete for, uh, the vet called Frank? Frank got fired because Frank was doing things that he wasn't supposed to be doing. Frank is going away now. What do we lose? We're going to lose the fact Joe, the, the Joe call, pet called Joe is gone. We're also going to lose the fact that procedure number four happened. We aren't going to lose the fact that any procedures happen on April 5th because that exists elsewhere. So that's the, in, that's the deletion anomaly. Let's just say um, it's Betty. If we need to update it, Bob's name, we need to do it in two places. So Bob becomes Betty, but you've got to do it twice. Not a good time. So that's called an update anomaly. And the insertion anomaly is we can't add a new pet currently unless we add a pet. Could be the existing vet, but he has to have a vet. Same thing here. You hire a new vet. You can't have a new vet unless you've got a pet for them. So that's the problem that we're at right now. Those are the anomalies we need to resolve. So what we want to do is we want to take this and break it down. And since we took the time to identify our bits and pieces, we have the following relations. We'd call this one vets. And in here, you'd have vet ID, vet name. And yes, I know I'm using camel cake because it's not a final design. You have pets. And here you have the pet ID and the pet name. And now with the thing we have left is the procedure and the date. What we have for this is we'd have procedures. And we have to be careful because there's a bit of an assumption happening here with our data. And a lot of people don't realize it when you first look at it, this kind of a structure. What happens right now, we have a procedure called 1, 2, 4, 2, 1. What's procedure number 4? You don't know. Do anybody know what procedure number two is? We, we don't have a name for it. So when you do work with normalization, sometimes you have to do what's called an assumption. And I already said earlier, assumptions are bad. You should never assume because it makes an ass out of you and me, right? You should never, ever assume. However, by the same token, sometimes you do have to make an assumption because you don't have all the data. Sometimes you have to make the assumption that the procedure ID is coming from somewhere else. So then you make a note.
In this case, is the candidate the procedure ID is a candidate in another unknown table. Sometimes you don't know. And as I tried training, start training you guys, when you don't know, you ask questions. But sometimes this, the answers are unsatisfactory, and you just don't know. So what we end up doing is we can start assuming that the procedures table somewhere up there. But the data apply, uh, assumes an appointment, right? So we probably have to have a table called Procedure appointments. Now, what does procedure appointments give us? It, we need the VET ID, the PET ID, the procedure ID, and the date. So we have the VET ID, the PET ID, the procedure ID, and the date. Now, we've now account accounted for all the data. That's the other thing. When you go through the steps of normal, you're not allowed to lose data. If you end up at this stage and you go, wait a minute, what happened to that column? That means you lost data. And you never want to lose data. That's defeating the point of normalization. And I just remembered what I wanted to say. Hot damn. I put myself a little note there so I remember what to talk about. So we don't know what's happening with the procedures, and we honestly don't know where this is coming from. So the entire time when you're doing this process is you're going on the assumption that the procedure ID is coming from somewhere in the ether. We don't know where it's coming from. It's just coming from somewhere else that we haven't been provided with. As long as you note your assumption, you've done your homework, and you've, you've got yourself a nice CYA. For those of you that don't know what CYA stands for, it means it covered your assets. Sets. <laughs> yes. Yes. Not unless you've been given. It's been given to you. The process of normalization. You don't create new data. You don't lose data. You work with what you've been given. That's why I said right now we can't create more information about procedure ID because we really don't know. This is a big unknown. Once we've you know, you could be sitting there and you provide this to the customer, and the customer says, well, yeah, we actually have a list of procedures. And then they give you a book. And you're like, great. Now I'm going to do some design work from scratch because it's not in the system. Or they say, well, we actually do have that. It's just what happens. It's a lookup table we have in the system. Great job. Where is it? What's the structure look like? Then they give it to you. And then they can suddenly go, oh, Great. Now we know about procedures, and I'm going to put it in green. Suddenly we got extra information because they provided it to you later. But I put it in green because we really don't know. Okay. Now. That is the basic process of normalization. This is actually very similar to lab four, lab five, five. Very similar to lab five, what I just did. Lab five has two of these. You can spend your time going like this if you're not comfortable working with data. But that's why the lab exists. Now, I made my little note what I wanted to talk about. Sometimes people get overzealous in normalization. By overzealous means they go too far. There is such a thing as going too far. And the most common one I see, especially from students, because they think this is the coolest thing ever, breaking stuff down to the smallest component pieces, is cities. Right? You look at some data, and it's set up like this. Grab my marker. I'm going to erase my assumption. And you have an address that looks like this. Oh, 
Ottawa is being repeated twice in my data. And it's, people say, it's repeating data. Sure, of course it is. But unless your Canada Post or insert your preferred postal service here, you know, USPS or, you know, wherever, whatever postal service exists elsewhere, you're not going to put, you're not going to get them to track this. And as part of the normalization process, often people will actually do this. They'll go, they'll create an en entity that looks like this. Name, address, I'm writing really, really small, city ID. Then they have another tape, the city ID in it, and then they got name of the city, right? And you have this kind of thing happening. Congratulations. Now somebody's got to type in the name of every village, city, town, metropolitan. How do you break down something like Ottawa or Toronto? Where technically, but you have Canada, Nepean, Gloucester, or New Orleans, Ottawa, Stittsville. And as the borders keep growing, it keep, they keep adding. The same thing with Toronto, where you've got Mississauga, and you've got North York, and you've got whatever the hell else happens in New York, and, and Toronto, or New, even New York with all the boroughs. Which ones are you going to decide to put in here? It's, it becomes a data management nightmare. So when normalizing, you do have to stop at a certain point. And it's called common sense. Which, when you first start out, there's a lot of common sense lacking. That's part of the learning experience. In other words, if you also look at your design and your normalization process and you go, Jane's going to want to kick my ass if I do this. If you use those phrases in your head, you look at it and go, that's terrible to inflict that on anyone. That's probably going too far. It's common sense. Usually a city is named a certain way and it's only spelt one way. Ottawa is only spelt Ottawa. Whereas you know, some other people say, well, what about provinces and stuff like that? Why would you not normalize, why would you normalize provinces? Well, there once was a time where you could write the province three different ways. O-N, O-N-T, or Ontario. And let's not get started about Newfoundland. Where it was Newfoundland, or it was Newfoundland Labrador, or it was NFL, or NFLD, NLD, NFD. I've seen it written every single way. That is a finite list. There's only, you know, X number of provinces and territories in Canada. There's only 50 American states, contiguous states. England only has so many counties. France only has so many, whatever the hell they're called there. You know, Australia has, what, five states? Four or five states? Australia. So countries are broken down only so far. They're, they're reasonable lists. Cities and countries, the cities are not. So that's what I had to remember is that when you normalize, don't go too far either. You look at the data and sometimes you'll just look and go, okay, that's dumb. We don't, we don't want to break this down any further than it needs to be. But as I said, you also don't want to go. Okay, that's normalization.